Good morning, good evening, and a very good afternoon to you wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to the 2020 uh, Richard uh, Musgrave Lecture, which is presented this evening by the CIS-EFO and the IIPF, the International Institute of Public Finance, and sponsored by G -G GLL Real Estate Partners, GMBH. My name is Marcus John Henry Brown, and it will be my job to guide us through this evening and make sure all of the pixels come in the right order and that our speakers stay on time. Yes, this is the 12th Richard Musgrave Lecture, but it's also the very first virtual Richard Musgrave Lecture since it was first awarded in 2009. We would have loved to have welcomed you all here personally to Munich, but that is impossible under the current circumstances. Nevertheless, we have a fantastic 90 minutes for you with guests joining us from Copenhagen, Ontario, and three separate self-isolation studios scattered all over Munich. You'll be able to ask questions of our guests too by using the Slido website um, it's ridiculously easy to use. You just need to follow the URL, which should appear any minute now on screen. And all you need to do is to pop that URL into your browser and ask the questions of our guests. Ah, there it is. Perfect. Slido.com slash sesifo. Uh, ask as many questions as you like, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can during the Q&A section. So that's the housekeeping part of this evening. So here to get the show started properly and to kick off the 2020 Richard Musgrave Lecture with his welcoming address is the president of CES EFO and the IIPF, Clemens Fuchs. Thank you very much, Mar Marcus. Uh, dear Klaus, dear colleagues and members of the faculty, dear friends of CES IFO and IIPF, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure really uh, to welcome you to the 12th Richard Musgrave lecture. Uh, and indeed, as Marcus just said, uh, the first lecture in this virtual format. This year, uh, the lecture will be delivered by Professor Klaus Dustrup Keiner from the University of Copenhagen. And it will be on behavioral heterogeneity, inequality, and public policy. Klaus, uh, it's great, really. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to be this year's Richard Musgrave visiting professor. Uh, it's an honor that you're joining us today. Uh, we are absolutely delighted about this. Uh, now, we had, of course, hoped to welcome you here physically in Munich uh, and uh, to come together. And the idea was that this event would have taken place in March. But uh, as we all know, uh, the pandemic uh, surprised us, came over us uh, in the spring. Uh, so we had to reschedule it. But we are very glad uh, to have you, Klaus, giving the lecture today uh, online. Now, uh, several distinguished guests are participating from their homes and offices uh, tonight. And let me just mention some of them. I would like to welcome Professor Catherine Cuff from McMaster University in Canada. She's vice president of the IAPF, and she will later give the laudation. A very warm welcome to Hans-Werner Zinn, uh, the founder of this lecture series, uh, to Florian Engelmeyer, the dean of our economics faculty here in Munich. And I would also like to welcome Gerd Kremer, Managing Director of GLL Real Estate Partners, and Dr. Klaus Helbig, who is Chairman of the Supervisory Board. Uh, GLL Real Estate Partners have been our friends and supporters for these lectures for a long time, and we are very grateful. Uh, now, what is the Richard Musgrave Lecture? The lecture series was launched 12 years ago by IIPF and the CES IFO Group in Munich to honor Richard Musgrave. Now, Richard Musgrave, as many of you know, uh, uh, is, is uh, something like the father of modern public economics. Uh, he brought European ideas 
about public finance to the United States and established public finance really as a discipline in the Anglo-Saxon world. Now, we fondly remember his visits here in Munich. He was here several times. Uh, he is the author of the first CES working paper. And one event I remember, and I'm sure many of us uh, remember in particular, uh, was um, a several day uh, debate he had with uh, Jim Buchanan. Uh, it was, as it were, a clash of titans where these two economists discussed their rather contrasting views about the role of governments. Now, the Richard Musgrave visiting professor is chosen each year by uh, the following committee, the president and the vice presidents of the IIPF uh, and the president of CES IFO. Uh, the candidate should be a distinguished scholar in the field of public finance, and uh, he must have made groundbreaking contributions to the field. The nomination committee convened in March 2019. That was a different world then. The committee members uh, for uh, this year's uh, prize included uh, Kate Kaff, who is also here tonight, and Wojciech Kopczuk uh, as the two IIPF vice presidents, and myself in dual capacity as the president of IIPF and uh, the director of CES IFO. Now, selecting Klaus as this year's Musgrave professor was a task that came very easy to us. Uh, Klaus is one of the world's leading scholars in public economics in his generation. He has been a CES IFO Network Fellow since the year 2000. Uh, and Kate Kaff, who will deliver the laudation, will tell us more about his truly outstanding achievements. Uh, now, before we move on to Kate's laudation, let me emphasize what Marcus just said. Uh, everyone in the audience, regardless of where you may be in the world, can interact with us directly and ask questions uh, through the website Slido. So please do participate, uh, enter the code hashtag CESIFO on the website and uh, uh, give us your questions. Now, I'm very much looking forward to this evening uh, and uh, we should get started. Marcus, over to you. Thank you very much, Clemens. Um, it's time now for this evening's laudation, and we're honored to be joined by Professor Catherine Cuff, who is Professor of Economics at McMaster's University in Ontario. Catherine Cuff holds a BA Economics with Honours from the Queen's University, an MA in Economics from York University, and a PhD in Economics from Queen's University, her doctoral thesis being titled Three Essays on Optimal redistributive policies. She is a faculty member of the McMaster Decision Science Laboratory, an experimental economics research center where she focuses on the topic of funding and financing issues in Canadian healthcare. And as Clemens has just mentioned, she is also the IIPF vice president. And we are delighted to have her here this evening. Thank you. I am delighted to be able to introduce this year's Richard Musgrave Lecture, Klaus Thustoff Kreiner. The Richard Musgrave Visiting Professorship was jointly established by CESIFO and the International Institute of Public Finance in honor of the memory of Richard Musgrave, who was both a founding member of CESIFO and an elected honorary president of the IIPF. And it is in my role as one of the vice presidents of the IIPF that I give this laudation. So this annual prize is awarded to an outstanding scholar in the area of public finance. And this year's award recipient is, without a doubt, a truly outstanding public finance scholar. Klaus's current public economics research is state-of-the-art. It's grounded in economic theory, it uses high-quality administrative data, utilizes unique data linkages, it adopts experimental, including state of preference, incentivized end field experiments, as well as quasi experimental approaches to establish credible identification. And it answers important public policy questions. Now, preparing this laudation has also given me the opportunity to reflect back on Klaus's research. And I was struck how, over the course of his academic career, his work has informed all three of Musgrave's functions of government activities allocation distribution, and stabilization. Let me start with the last one. 
Musgrave's stabilization function relates to maintaining standard macroeconomic outcomes, employment, the price level, and the rate of growth. Klaus's early work contributed a number of insights into the determinants of these outcomes and the stabilization role of both monetary and fiscal policies And he did this by incorporating more realistic assumptions into the standard models used at the time. For example, by exploring the effect of having both monopolistic and competitive behavior, unions, which was a salient feature of the Danish labor markets, allowing for quantity adjustments, and more realistic assumptions on skill formation. Further, he demonstrated that monetary policy in a menu cost framework could generate a feedback effect. The policies can influence the consequences of shocks, which in turn affect agents' decisions to adjust prices and therefore ultimately affect price rigidity. In his first paper to appear in the Journal of Public Economics, for which he is now co-editor, Klaus also showed that taxes in a new Keynesian economy can can contribute to price and wage stickiness. Further, unlike what we teach our undergrads, this paper demonstrated that which side of the market a tax is imposed can affect resource allocation. This last paper would, in my view, mark the beginning of Klaus's research focus on the allocation and distribution functions of government activities. So Musgrave's allocation function relates to the provision of social goods. If such provision is financed by distortionary taxation, then we need to account for the efficiency losses in making public expenditure decisions. In one of my favorite papers of Klaus's, he and his co-author take an empirically relevant observation that individuals respond to taxes on the participation margin, and they carefully work through the implications for both the theory and measurement of the marginal cost of public funds. This result has obvious implications for the optimal provision of public goods, which Klaus explores in some of his later work. Around this time, Klaus also began leveraging high-quality Danish administrative data to examine important issues related to the elasticity of taxable income, such as income shifting, labor mobility, and tax avoidance. His papers in this area have been published in the very top economic journals and reflect successful collaborations with both a wide range of co-authors and government agencies in Denmark. As just one example, in collaboration with the Danish Tax Collection Agency, he and his co-authors undertook a tax audit field experiment that provided credible evidence of the importance of third-party reporting and tax compliancy, a feature of real-world tax systems that, again, was missing from our standard models. Finally, Busgrave's distribution function relates to questions about the appropriate fiscal instruments for redistribution, the determinants of distribution, and what constitutes a fair distribution. Klaus's work on the optimal taxation of couples speaks directly to whether taxes should be based on individual or joint income and his work on the optimal design of the tax transfer system at the bottom of the income distribution has contributed to ongoing policy debates about the use of welfare or in-work benefits. Klaus's work has also provided important evidence on the role of wealth transfers for both wealth inequality and wealth formation across generations using Danish wealth records. And in some very recent work, Klaus, together with co-authors, has linked Danish survey data with administrative records to determine how individuals perceived and actual social positions in terms of how their income compares to others affects their views on fairness. In the preface to the fifth edition of their undergraduate textbook, Richard and Peggy Musgrave state, public finance, in both theory and practice, do not stand still. And neither, I would argue, does Klaus's research program. I simply can't do justice to Klaus's academic contributions here, but I hope to have at least illustrated the breadth of his work and some of its insights into the functioning of the public sector. Importantly for a discipline that I think tends to overemphasize work based on U.S. data, he has taught us that we can learn a lot from a relatively small country and that there is still a lot more we can learn. In 2017, Klaus helped to establish the Center for Economic Behavior and Inequality, a new center of excellence at the University of Copenhagen funded by the Danish National Research Foundation, and he serves as its director. This was an ambitious undertaking and is proving highly successful even in this short period of time. The center is engaging an international network of researchers, utilizing a wide range of economic methods and approaches, supporting the development of junior researchers, 
and importantly, undertaking and producing high quality policy relevant research on redistribution, health and inequality. Issues that have all taken on a much greater significance with the current pandemic. Let me conclude now by saying that like Musgrave, Klaus is actively involved in both SESIPO as the director of its public economics area and in the IIPF as an elected member of the Board of Management, much, I think, to the benefit of both institutions. So with that, I'd like to say congratulations, Klaus, on this very well-deserved award. So many thanks, Professor Cuff. We've now reached the part of the evening, which is unfortunately almost impossible to do virtually. Nonetheless, I know that Clemens is going to give it his best shot. So I'll hand back to the president of SESIFO, uh, and the IPF, uh, who is joined now by Klaus Tustrup Kreiner, the recipient of the Richard Musgrave Visiting Professorship 2020. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, hello, Klaus. Now, uh, this is the award handover ceremony, and obviously, uh, this is difficult to do online, but we will manage. Uh, before we come to that, uh, Klaus, there is one thing I wanted to ask you. Uh, now, of course, we um, studied uh, your CV in detail when you, we selected you for the Musgrave uh, uh, lecture. And there was one thing that really intrigued me, and I have to ask you that. Uh, uh, there is a very long list of awards on your CV, obviously, no surprise here. I think the first award you got was for your master thesis, right? Uh, uh, but there is one award I found particularly interesting. It is called the Invisible Hand Award. And you received, that struck me, this award not once, but twice. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about what this award is? It's called the Invisible Hand Award, uh, inspired by uh, Adam Smith, I guess. So what lies in the uh, Invisible Hand, maybe it was when we in the old days had a chalk or something. So originally this prize has been here for many, many years uh, and has always been called been, yeah, the invisible hand. So I'm proud to have students have nominated me for that prize twice. That's great. Thank you, Klaus. I'm not surprised. I do remember a couple of years ago that you gave a lecture that was to uh, a set of lectures, in fact, to doctoral students. And uh, that's from there I know you're a great teacher. So I'm absolutely sure this. Uh, this this award is uh, well deserved, but I really like the name. I think every economist feels touched by uh, the invisible hand idea uh, and the prize with that name. Okay, now we come uh, to the uh, uh, award handover, and what I will do is just read the uh, text here uh, on the certificate, uh, and the idea was we would show it on the screen. Uh, so uh, the Richard Musgrave lecture. Uh, and the Visiting Professorship 2020 is awarded jointly by CES IFO and the International Institute of Public Finance to Professor Klaus Tustrup Keiner, who will deliver the Richard Musgrave Lecture on Behavioral Heterogeneity, Inequality, and Public Policy. Okay, now that is the handover. You know, I uh, have an envelope here. Uh, and I will put this all together. It's hard to show in the camera. Uh, here is the envelope. So this will be sent to you to Copenhagen. Uh, it's all yours now. I will look after it. Uh, so congratulations again, Klaus. Uh, I'm uh, really excited uh, that you are our Musgrave lecturer this year. And I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you so much, Clemens. Uh, it's a uh, you know it's a big big honor. Uh, I cannot tell you how much it means to me. And uh, you know, following the footsteps of uh, of previous award winners who are people I admire so much, it's just uh, that's a big honor. And thanks to, thanks also to Catherine for for this fantastic description of my merits. Uh, you know, I get uh, I get completely embarrassed actually. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much, all of you, and, and to the committee for selecting me. Um, I'm very happy. Wonderful. Okay, let's get to work now. Let's do the lecture. Okay.
Yeah, fantastic. Congratulations, Professor Kreiner. Klaus Tumstrup Kreiner is Professor of Economics and the Director of the Center for Economic Behavior and Inequality, CB, at the University of Copenhagen. Co editor of the Journal of Public Economics and Area Director for Public Economics in the SAIS EFO Network. He received the PhD degree in economics in 1998 and became the full professor in 2005. His work together with colleagues at CB and at many other university, universities around the world, including Harvard, Berkeley, the London School of Economics and Columbia University focuses on inequality in income, wealth, health and optimal re distribution policy and behavioral responses um, to public policy. This work has been published in top academic journals such as the American Economic Review, Econ Econometrica and PNAS. He also has practical policy experience. He was recently a member of a tax commission that resulted in a tax reform in Denmark. And he has been the co-chair of a Danish Economic Council from uh, 2010 until 2014. This evening, Professor Kreiner will be sharing his research, his findings and his ideas with, the, with his Richard Musgrave lecture, which is called Behavioral Heterogeneity, Inequality and Public Policy. It is a big honor to give this year's Richard Musgrave lecture. I originally thought about giving a talk on uh, academic and policy work on taxation, which would have been a natural topic for this lecture. But I've chosen instead to present you with what I find to be a very exciting and important uh, research program, which is a key focus also of uh, our research center, CB at University of Copenhagen. The title is Behavioral Heterogeneity inequality and public policy. I hope and believe Richard Roske will have appreciated this talk. He uh, transformed policy analysis in 1950s and 60s by bringing in modern tools from microeconomics. What I will talk about today is how new advances in data gathering can inform us about heterogeneity in economic behavior and why this is important for thinking about inequality and public policy. So inequality is differences in outcomes across individuals. And we observe systematic differences in income and wealth, but also in health, life expectancy, probability of becoming unemployed, propensity to get into financial trouble, and so on. Broadly speaking, the determinants of such inequality may be divided into circumstances out of control of the individual and behavioral determinants related to decision making and choices of the individuals. By differences in behavior, behavioral heterogeneity, I think of differences across people in preferences, behavioral biases, expectations, perceptions, or attitudes. So economy has a long tradition in assuming homogeneous behavior. For example, in an influential paper by George Stigler and Gary Baker in the American Economic View in the 70s, they write, one may usefully treat tastes as stable over time and similar among people. Now, uh, if you describe this assumption to people out in the real world, then they say, really? Do you really do that? You know, look around you, people are different. They make different choices. But of course, there are good reasons why we normally do this in economics. And I think that basically two reasons. One of them is reflected in this citation that you have here, which is more recent, saying macroeconomists have been reluctant to fiddle too much with preferences because their inherent unobservability puts little discipline on this exercise. So the argument here is basically that 
well, if we cannot uh, really observe it, then there's no reason to make a lot of it and try to build theories around because at the end of the day, it is unobservable, unobservable so we need to stick to the assumption of homogeneity. A second reason why we may argue that homogeneous behavior is a good assumption is that it will not change our key findings. Sort of, so if you allow for heterogeneity in behavior, you get the same result. So this is basically an Oaken's ratio argument that there's no reason to try to make something complicated if it does not change our main findings. Now, what I'm gonna argue today is that first, we are now in a situation where we can open up this black box uh, of heterogeneity in behavior and start analyzing it. And secondly, I'm gonna argue that this is actually very important for policy conclusions and policy questions. So in the rest of my talk, I will first talk about why is it important to learn about behavioral heterogeneity and, uh, and its application for economic policy. And secondly, I will give you a few examples of research making progress in this direction. So let me start with an example of the standard approach. Think about differences in income. In standard theory, this is often due to differences in innate abilities of people that vary across people. On the other hand, people are assumed to have the same preferences, so we assume homogeneous behavior. So this fundamental structure underlies, for example, a standard theory of optimal income taxation and redistribution policy, such as the classical Merlis model. Now for the public finance people present here today, let me be a little more precise. So think about utility function here, where the utility or well-being of individuals is a function of two arguments. The first is, is consumption here, where why is income and you pay taxes as a function of income. So the first here is disposable income, which is your consumption level. Higher net income gives you higher consumption and more utility. The second argument is saying here you have income again, and then divided by the wage rate uh, per hour, which reflects your ability level. And what you then have here is the number of hours people work, and the assumption is that the more you work, then the margin of this utility of more work is, uh, is increasing. So because of heterogeneity now across people and abilities, wage rate here, you wish to redistribute income. And the optimal degree of redistribution in society will now depend on the trade-off between social preferences for inequality and the efficiency loss from taxation. So that's the standard setup. So now let me turn this around and take the other extreme case. So think of a situation where people have the exact same ability levels, but they have different preferences. So we can actually make a simple reinterpretation of the classical Merlis model to capture this case. So here, everything as before, the utility function is the same as before, but note now that theta here reflects taste for work. So people uh, vary according to test or some wish to work more and, and put in more effort than others. And this parameter is now a preference parameter that varies across people. So in this case, you get the exact same policy, you get the exact same policy result out of the model. Um, so what this is saying is, well, the type of heterogeneity does not matter. Uh, you can have heterogeneity because of differences in abilities, or you can have it because of differences in preferences, but at the end of the day, you're gonna get the same policy conclusion out of that. Now, the question is whether this is a, sort of more like an artifact of the model than being something that really captures uh, how people use it. So does it matter for policy views of people whether this, this is governed by one type of heterogeneity or the other type of heterogeneity. So what, you, uh, what we report here is uh, results from a sur simple survey where we have asked a large representative sample of people two questions. So the first question is, to what extent do you think the government should reduce differences in income that are due to differences that people do not themselves influence? 
So that is circumstances here. And people answer now on a scale from one to seven on the demand for redistribution. And each dot here is the average for, for a given age. So this dot is the average response for people who are 18 years old, 19 years old, and so on. And then people are saying, well, they want a certain level of redistribution here when it's driven by circumstances. Now, the second question states, to what extent do you think that the government should reduce differences in income that are due to differences in people's own decisions? So this gives you the red dots here. And what you can see now is that people demand much more redistribution if inequality is governed by circumstances than if it's governed by heterogeneity and behavior. So what this is telling us is that people would actually like to know how much inequality is driven by circumstances and to what extent it's driven by heterogeneity and behavior. So you may think that this may sound like sort of like a re right wing research endeavor that we want to quantify how much is due to behavior. However, this is, uh, this is not the case. When you include heterogeneity in our hand behavior, sometimes you get some conclusions that could be more left wing or more right wing. And in the end of the day, it's also here an empirical question, how much is due to circumstances and how much is due to behavior? So let me give you three examples showing that it matters for the design of optimal policy. So the first example is on tax compliance behavior. Think of a situation where the overall evasion rate in the economy is 5% of overall income. Now this may come about in two ways. In the first case, all individuals evade 5% of their income. So if you think about this case and you want to raise tax revenue, then you could put in some uh, more re resources into tax enforcement and get more income out of people. Not however, this is not the optimal choice because everybody is just a meeting. So it, this will just cost you resources. It's much, much easier just to rate the statutory tax rate and increase the tax rate a little and get more revenue without losing more resources out of on tax enforcement. However, well, we think now about the second case. In the second case, we have 5% of individuals who evade all their income, and then 95% of people who do not evade at all. So in this case, you will have uh, very differences in, uh, you know, some are uh, uh, honest and some are completely dishonest. So you can see from a fairness consideration, now you really want to have tax enforcement policy in order to find the 5% with cheating and get that income into to, uh, government revenue. You might also think that these 5% are maybe people in the top of the distribution. And if that is the case, then we are basically completely underestimating how much inequality, inequality we have in society because it's basically only people who are on the top who have evaded their income. So what you see here is that conclusion is that it's important to know whether what we observe here in the aggregate level is due to homogeneous behavior of people or due to heterogeneity in the behavior of people. And you will get different policy conclusions depending on what type of, of model is the right one. My second example is about household financial behavior. So now think about a situation where 5% of people get into financial trouble and consider two different reasons why that is. So in the first case, people borrow money and they expect to pay back at some point in the future, but 5% of people are unlucky, are hit by random unexpected events, for example, unemployment shocks. So in this case, the optimal policy response is social insurance policies as we have it in the welfare state. So we have unemployment insurance benefits and social assistance, which will also help people to deal with this problem and not get into financial trouble so easily. On the other hand, this 5% of people get into financial trouble may arise because you have 5% of people who are basically over consuming. So say they have myopic behavior or self-control problems or a present bias, and therefore they get into this problem and have consumed too much and are now facing financial trouble and cannot 
uh, pay back that debt and cannot get more loans uh, because of these problems. Now in this second case here, the optimal uh, solution is not to have social insurance here uh, because people will still just get into these problems because they're gonna over consume. Now instead, the optimal policy will be either to try to see if you can change that behavior, and if not, then it is very, it's probably optimal to put in an interest ceiling on, uh, on loans from the financial sector, and that will prevent easy to get SMS loans and internet loans at extremely high interest rates. These loans will not be offered anymore because they can only, only uh, profitable to the financial sector if they have a very high interest rate. So that will prevent these people from getting into these financial trouble. So note again, in the first case, you have a homogeneous behavior of people, but you have random shocks creating the variation. While in the second case, you have heterogeneity in behavior of people, and the policy conclusions are very different depending on what is the right underlying model here. My third example is about heterogeneity in perceptions. So think about a situation where on average people perceive income of others correctly. So this may arise for two reasons. Everybody is well informed of the income of others. So in this case, everybody uh, knows uh, about uh, the degree of inequality in society. But in the second case, people are on average correct, but it's because the rich believe the poor are rich. And at the same time, the poor believe the rich are poor. So in this case, on average, perception are correct. And everybody believes there's no inequality whatsoever in society. So therefore, you know, there's no need for redistribution policy if you ask people because they don't observe any inequality, don't perceive any inequality. And if you do inform them, then they might change their views and may think that we should have more redistribution policy. So this example, I think, illustrates why you want to know more about behavioral heterogeneity and the relative importance of circumstances and behavior. Now later I will show you some results on these topics. But before that, let me tell you a little about our methods here when we want to say something about heterogeneity in behavior, which is of course a challenge. So how can we observe it? So what we do at our research center CB is to combine often different types of data. So we have our own servers at Statistics Denmark and we have access to a lot of data, for example, tax returns data for the full population since 1980. We can access that data remotely and analyze it, but we cannot get the data in our hands, but we can do all the analysis and get the results back to us and to, um, and publish. So in addition to this data, we update, obtain data from many other different external resources. For example, one project uses transaction data from a big bank in order to get a measure of spending behavior. We have done preference, uh, internet preference experiments, eliciting preferences. We have done surveys where we try to measure people's uh, perceptions. And we do, uh, we get data from the Danish tax authorities where we have received information on all loans of the Danish population and whether they are in the delinquent on these loans. And one project even uses information about people on whether they're hidden information away in uh, offshore. In all these cases, data are transferred to Statistics Denmark and then linked to other type of, of registered data. So in a, in a moment, I will give you some concrete example of research projects. Beforehand, I would like to acknowledge the work of many other people. So now I'm getting all the glory here today, but I have worked with many co-authors and we are now a large group of researchers working on this research agenda at CB. This includes, for example, a full-time uh, data manager, reflecting that getting all this data and permissions and so on takes a lot, a lot of resources also in Denmark. In the rest of my talk, I will briefly describe four examples of research projects on behavioral heterogeneity and inequality. The first project is joint work with CP members 
David Dre Alassen, Søren Lett Petersen and Gregor Smytoff Rasmussen. And also external CP members Thomas Eber, Hans Fair and Helga Fair Duda. Now a prediction from very basic economic theory is that if you are more patient, then you will save more and you will become more wealthy in the future. Now it then also follows that if you have people who are more patient, then they will save more and become more wealthy than less patient individuals. To test it, this hypothesis, we uh, invited a representative sample of prime age individuals to participate in an internet experiment where we use standard methods from experimental economics to elicit patients and also other preference parameters. The experiments are modern versions of the famous marshmallow experiment carried out with children in the 60s, where children were offered marshmallows if they could demonstrate patience. So you can see an example here uh, of a screenshot where people can choose between money in eight weeks from now or getting more money in 16 weeks from now. And in this case, people are playing with real money, which afterwards are transferred uh, on these dates to uh, their bank accounts according to the choices they have made in the experiments. Afterwards, the data is transferred to Statistics Denmark and linked with wealth records and a lot of other data. The graph here illustrates the key finding. So we have divided people into three groups of equal size according to their level of patience. And for each group, we now plot the average percentile position of individuals in the wealth distribution of uh, within their cohort over time. What you now can see is that patient individuals on average are six to seven percentiles higher up in the wealth distribution than the less patient individuals. And this is very stable here over a period of 15 years. This correlation between patients and, and their wealth position is of the same magnitude as the relationship between wealth and education which is striking because education is known to be one of the best predictors of inequality. Now, it is close to impossible in this type of research to make empirical designs uh, with precise identification of causality. So you will need to change people's type uh, over a long period of time, which is basically impossible. But by including a huge set of controls from various data, for example, people's complete income history, their their school grades, uh, whether they are credit constraints or not, other preferences like risk preferences, social preferences. We are able here to pro pro provide suggestive evidence showing that what you see here is actually running through the savings channel with more patient people saving more and therefore becoming more wealthy. Now, of course, you may also worry here about reverse causality going on here to deal with that. We actually get, uh, got a survey when people were between 18 and 20 years old, old, where we got a crude measure of people's patient level. And we could actually replicate this figure that you have where you observe people who are in their prime age and you got the same result. So this basically uh, give a very strong uh, suggestive result here. This is not reverse causality and that you have a strong relationship between patients savings and wealth inequality as predicted by the theory. The second project I will talk about is on the relationship between tax evasion and inequality. It is a project by CB researcher Nils Johannesson together with Annette Alstersetter and Gabriel Sukman. So we normally say that tax evasion does not have first order effects on inequality. The reason is that tax evasion rate is more or less constant across income or wealth groups of people. So in this case, relative measures of inequality, such as, for example, the Gini coefficient, is unaffected by evasion. So you can see by the red dots in the graph here that the evasion rate found here in, uh, from uh, tax audits is basically constant at a level of 2 to 4% across the distribution. This actually aligns with what I found myself together with other researchers in a randomized uh, tax audit study. 
However, the tax audits do not capture evasion involving that people may hide wealth away in shell companies or at offshore accounts. So recently, leaks from offshore financial institutions, such as the, the Panama Papers or the Swiss leaks that most people have heard about, have revealed that some people have actually significant amounts hidden away. Nils and co-authors got access to the information on Scandinavians in these leaks. And with the collaboration of the tax authorities, it was possible to match it with the official wealth records and tax payments of these individuals. And then what you can see now is the blue dot, which shows the evasion range from offshore evasion across the distribution. And it's basically zero up to a level here of the top 1% of people. And in particular, if you look at the top 0.01% of the most wealthy people in society, then it actually turns out that they, on average, their evasion rate here on from the offshore evasion is 25%. So this is basically saying that the very rich dodge taxes much more than others. And it also implies the standard measures of inequality based on tax records severely underestimates the degree of inequality. The third project is joint work with two of my great colleagues, Jeanette Peterson and Louise Villaslev Olsen. So the focus, uh, focus of this paper is trying to understand why some people get into financial trouble while others do not. And we measure here financial trouble by being behind on loan payments by the end of the year. So in Denmark, all financial institutions have to third part report information on each loan of each day to the tax authorities, including whether people are behind on loan payments. After a lot of effort, we got access to this information for all loans of all Danes over a 10 year period. And we got the data linked to other registered data at Statistics Denmark, and also a survey we conducted. And the graph here that you see here basically shows what I think is a scary intergenerational relationship. The blue dots show the share of people in financial trouble when having parents who are not in financial trouble, while the red dot shows people who are in financial trouble who had parents or who have parents who were not previously, who were previously in financial trouble. And what you now see is at age 18, well, at that time, you know, you're just becoming adult and you can only start borrowing there. So there's no surprise, nobody is in financial trouble here. But then it picks up very soon here. And as soon as you can see here, you are able to borrow, then we see very different developments depending on parental background. At age 30, close to one out of four of the children are in financial trouble if coming from a background where parents had experienced financial trouble. While for people who have parents not in financial trouble, it is less than one out of, out of 20. So this shows a quite striking persistency across generations in financial trouble. Now, it's difficult here to, to, uh, to analyze the mechanism and we do uh, uh, provide a lot of evidence in the paper and our uh, results suggest that a key reason for this pattern is differences in risky people across uh, across people and differences and that children inherit this behavior from their parents. The last project I will talk about today is joint work with my colleague at SEBI, Christopher Bale Hvidberg and Stephanie Stanchima from Howard. This paper studies people's perceptions about social position relative to various reference groups and the role of social position for people's fantasies. The paper has many results, so I will just give you one example here. To study this issue, we invited a representative sample of prime age individuals to answer a survey we designed. So at the slide here, you see a picture from uh, uh, the device where people can choose here on a ladder their person type position in uh, an income distribution. Now this survey is afterwards linked to administrative data 
and where we get people's actual income uh, from tax return data. And people are asked also about income according to tax return. So in that sense, we know the true income of people and also of various peer groups that we ask them to compare themselves to. Now to make the first graph, we have asked people what they think the median income level of their cohort is. The graph shows that people in the lower part here of the distribution believe the median level is far lower than it actually is. Vice versa for people in the top of the distribution here, they basically believe that the median is higher than it actually is. So in this sense, Everybody believes on average that others are closer to themselves than they really are. In this sense, everybody underestimates the degree of inequality in society. So a second uh, point here is on this diagram. So when we ask people about where income differences uh, are most unfair, then people uh, agree that income differences across colleagues are most unfair. So in this graph, we zoom in on people's perceptions about their income position relative to colleagues. And what you can see here is that um, we plot people's perceived position against their actual position. And if they had correct perceptions, it would be on the 45 degree line here. And what you now see is that people in the top tend to underestimate their own position and likewise, people in the bottom, try, uh, in, in general, uh, overestimate their position. Basically, in a line aligned with what you saw here also in the first graph, now it's just people's own position that we are talking about. Now, what is actually striking here in this dimension when we do it with coworkers compared to many other type of reference groups is that in general, people in the bottom of distribution tend to overestimate most in this dimension of co-workers. So for example, people who are in position number 20 among co-workers, they believe on average that they are higher than position 40 among co-workers. So that is a, a very high degree of overestimation and the largest we find. And what is interesting here is that this is actually the exact same dimension where people believe that income differences is most unfair they get it most wrong. So here I only talked about very few examples of projects. At our research center, we study inequality in many dimensions. Uh, for example, gender inequality, inequality in health, longevity, inequality starting already uh, in, in childhood. And we use many type of approaches, including structural modeling, which I did not have time to talk about uh, today. Nevertheless, I hope I have persuaded you that this research program on behavioral heterogeneity, inequality, and public policy is exciting and important both academically, academically and for thinking about real world economic policy. Thanks for listening and thanks for participating. Thank you, Professor Kreiner. It's time now for the Q&A part of the evening, which will be moderated by Clemens uh, Fust. This is your chance to ask this evening's guests questions using the Slido website that I mentioned at the beginning of the stream. You should be able to see the URL now on the screen. So put that URL into your browser and ask as many questions as you like. Hopefully we'll have time to get through as many as possible. So thank you very much, Klaus. These were fascinating examples from this research agenda. Uh, now, as Marcus just said, uh, we are all invited to submit questions uh, and uh, maybe uh, I would start with the first question that has come in. It's coming from a colleague from Andre de Costa, and he says in economic models, behavior uh, is the outcome of preferences and constraints. 
what you call circumstances here, you seem to equate behavior with preferences. So this is about the terminology, right, which, which plays a role here. Uh, can you say yeah, no, about I think that? that's a, a super good question. So uh, <clears throat> it's very crude uh, to this sort of to, to put it into circumstances and behavior. And you could say in it's that the different things to it. One thing is when we measure it empirically, are we really measuring, for example, a constraint? Uh, and in the example we had on health inequality, what we used a lot of in the paper is actually to measure credit constraints. So we measure how much people, how much fund they have on their bank account relative to income, which is a common measure going back to sellers that has been used in the literature and the consumption literature to measure credit constraints. Uh, so in order to, to show that the results that we had, for example, here on uh, when, when, when people do the, pay, the, the experience with the patients, that is not really driven by uh, credit constraints. Um, so, so that is an empirical thing. I think sort of more conceptually, it's a, it's a super good question in that it, it um, first of all, um, it's difficult to, to do it without having really a model to synthesize what is circumstances and what is really behavior. And in many models, there will actually be an arrow, say, from circumstances to behavior in the sense that you are influenced by a situation that then affects your preferences. So uh, so I, I completely agree. So it's, it's like a crude way to, to say, okay, there's something that are sort of more circumstances and something that are more behavior at the end of the day. And I hope the, the policy examples just give you these kind of examples I think when you get specific on showing uh, how this is important. And then, of course, the empirical question then is, are we really measuring differences in behavior or is it differences in, as you're saying, constraints? It, does it reflect preferences at the end of the day? That can be super hard to, um, to measure. Um, so I could say our feeling here at our center is just, it's better to try to work on it instead of say, okay, we're simply going to assume homogeneous behavior as we have done always. And then we are going to make a lot of uh, conclusions that actually may be somehow wrong. For example, on on, uh, on financial trouble, where you're going to say, okay, the social insurance schemes, that is the right policy, which is not necessarily the case, right? Um, if you have heterogeneity in in um, in behavior. So there are more questions coming in, but you know, Kate, if you have comments, uh, I don't know if you would like to make a comment or or have a question. Just uh, you I, I do have something. A... Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I do have a. Please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you. If you don't mind, I wouldn't mind just asking Klaus a, a quick question. I'm interested to hear his thoughts on some of the public policy implications uh, for the results that he found with respect to um, the uh, uh, higher default rates for those whose parents have had financial troubles in the past. Uh, I'm just wondering if sort of what's the role of sort of the lack of parental insurance versus uh, the inheriting these risky behaviors and what are the implications then for policy that we could think about? Yeah, so uh, th thanks for that question. That's a really good question. So uh, so the reason for the intergenerational relationship, we are sort of, when we think about it theoretical, there can be uh, three type of explanations. One is that parents and children are hit by shocks at the same time. Um, so that's some kind of common shock, and uh, we do many things in the paper to show that that is actually not the case. And then obviously another case is that you have um, that you have uh, uh, risk sharing in the family. So and that is of course likely that parents will help out their kids if they get into into trouble. But we find very little uh, evidence of that. For example, when children get unemployed. We do not really see any big changes in uh, income or wealth of parents at that point. Um, and uh, so, so there may be something, but, but it, it certainly cannot explain sort of the very, very big changes that we have. Um, so and then we do other type of evidence which to, to, that provides uh, evidence on the behavior. Um, and for example, we uh, survey preferences uh, of, of the children and, and ask the children also of the, the preference of the parents and these kind of things correlate very much with the, with this pattern. Um, and we also use the register data to uh, measure uh, among parents how much liquidity they have had compared to income going back uh, 10, 15 years and see if that if they have a very persistent level 
then that's the way the consumption literature would say, well, that indicates that, that parents are, are patients. And then we use that as an instrument on, on the default of, of parents to explain the intergenerational uh, relationship. And the, the, the underlying hypothesis in this instrument is that that uh, liquidity of the parents 10, 15 years ago is not, uh, is a fork and all to the, the, the shocks that, that children are hit by. Uh, nowadays, so that that is a way to to try to get to that conclusion. So and and if we believe that conclusion, then I think sort of in terms of policy, uh, let's say it depends a lot on you know what is really difficult is to say whether it's irrationality in in at the end of the day, is this because people are very rational they 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 consume a lot and they just get into financial problems say okay that's fine you know because I had a big party. Um, our view is that that is probably not the case, but we cannot really say that it is irrationality. Uh, but if it's reflect present bias and sort of uh, myopic behavior, then of course, I think this points to uh, to the case where, well, if you cannot change that behavior in, uh, there are some studies trying to, nowadays to say if you can teach people in school and change behavior, that of course could be the, maybe the best solution, but that's really possible. But if that's not possible, then it indicates that there are really good reasons to put limits limits on interest rates on loans from financial sector. Where it is, I think we have good examples. Uh, we normally here in, in my group talk about Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob was an internet site uh, where I can say, okay, uh, uh, if you don't have money, get money from Uncle Bob now. And uh, the interest rate was, uh, I don't know, something like 100% at the, at, uh, uh, annually. And you can say, if you really take that out of loan rationally, or is it because you really get tempted? Um, so an interest rate ceiling would, would prevent that type of loans. And um, I think uh, we have presented this for the financial authorities and and, and, and the Danish Central Bank. Uh, and I think there's interest here among policymakers in, in Denmark to um, on these officials. But it will be difficult at the end of the day to say, okay, we have sort of a, um, proof bullet evidence. I think we are, it's going to be very difficult to, to get that far. Uh, on that class, it's a cheap point, but um, is it just education maybe? Is it that these people are not, okay, they happen to have parents who had problems, but it is, is it a problem of financial education simply? So, so, uh, so that could be, so, so, so the, all this evidence exists also when we, uh, we have non-parental diagram where we can sort of say, you know, even among where you have parents who are, are very high and also among children that are very, very high income, you actually see this pattern, which is striking. Although the default rate is much, much lower for people who are highly educated and have high income. But you see an intergenerational relationship there too from, from, uh, from parents to children, then controlling for that. Um, and then of course the, Big picture question is then uh, if it is really a sort of bad decision making in terms of irrationality, then how do we, uh, you know, is, is that something that is to change the school? We have had one of our great PhD students have, uh, have looked at actually people studying uh, economics using a regression discontinuity design and then comparing to people who, who actually got their first priority and got economics as their second priority. And what is interesting is that the default rate is, is significantly lower among those who got into economics, which indeed, which sort of suggests that it is possible to, uh, to change this default pattern, it seems, uh, through education. But of course, the message here is not that everybody should study then economics, right? <laughs> Five-year economics education. But, but compared to the most of the literature, which did not find any positive result, uh, Christopher, uh, his paper is actually, I think, the first part to, sh to show some result there very cleanly from education. That's fascinating. So uh, there are some very good questions in the, in the chat. One is about patience and wealth and what you showed uh, the, and, and uh, the marshmallow example. So the question is, uh, could the uh, causality not go the other way? Uh, so could it be uh, that wealthy people are just patient? Yeah, yeah, that's a super, super good question. So what we do in the paper is 
because this was a first order issue when we uh, did the analysis in this paper. So we used a lot of time to try to see if we could find other, and I think that sort of the, the best evidence we have is from a survey carried out um, in the 70s for people who are between 18 and 20 years old. And that time you had some questions about patients. It was of course not incentivized and in giving out real, real money as we are doing. Um, but we have sort of an, another experiment where we can show there's a relationship between these questions and how people perform in the experiment. And then when we now use these individuals who are today, I think they're today 55, and then we sort of look at a fifth, their, their period from 40 up to 55, then it is also the, it's also the case that those who are most patients is lying these six, it's actually a slightly stronger relationship. I think it's like eight percentiles higher. Uh, and you can say this was elicited, the patients when they were 18 years old, before they had sort of any real wealth. And you know, people at, eight, at that age, they don't really have any significant uh, wealth. So that suggested at least that it's not driven by, um, by reverse uh, causality. Right. So th th there is a set of questions about uh, these results. You have shown that people do not assess their income position correctly, and 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 in particular not when uh, comparing themselves to their colleagues. So a lot of people ask, you know, what's driving this? You talked a little bit about that. Uh, some one question says, uh, is it maybe because the education is similar to that of colleagues? Uh, so, uh, so I didn't maybe have so much time here to be precise. So the, the first question we, when we ask about colleagues, when what we actually ask about is if is first co-workers in the sector where you work. And the thing is, and we also ask people about their sector. So do they know the sector where they work? And we also know the sector where they work. So, uh, so that's one definition of, of colleagues here. But another definition is we ask people about their workplace, not the firm, because the firm can have many workplaces, but we ask people about the, their workplace. And then we start by asking people, how many are they working in their workplace? And what's so there, for example, we say they work 33 persons. And then we ask, where are you in this, among this 37 on, on, a, on a ladder? And then people can say, I'm number 12. And we can then compare, rescale that to a scale from, from one to 100. Um, so, so in that sense, we ask people, that's the way we ask people about it. Um, and uh, and you're, of course, it's difficult to really know now why people, uh, first of all, why are they most wrong? It's only people in the sort of lower part of the distribution they are most wrong in, the, in that situation. Another thing is that they are most wrong in this dimension where they, where they feel fairness is, uh, is sort of, yeah, this kind of the income differences, fairness is most important. And what I did not show you is that when we ask people about to, to report the person time 95, that is in the very high income within their sector, then the thing is, Everybody get that wrong, wrong on average. Everybody believes that there are less inequality within their sector. Well, they are very good at, at estimating P95 in municipality or in the old cohort or within their gender and so on. But in particular, if we think about the income differences within the sector they work, everybody in general underestimate P95 and believe it is, it is much, much lower than it really is. So that, that's interesting because, again, it's the dimension where we ask people about fairness and they say, we, we ask people about income differences in their sector and they score that uh, as being more unfair than income differences in other, uh, in other groups. And that is actually the, the situation, that, that is at the same time the domain where you could say they underestimate inequality in general um, in that domain. Uh, a question about that, could it be that it has to do with, um, I think psychologists call it dignity. So you have a picture of yourself, you look at yourself and you think, you know, it would be, especially if I was the person with the lowest income, uh, this would kind of question my dignity. And and uh, I, I don't want to have this picture of myself to be, of being the guy who is put it. Does that, yeah. could that play a role or? 
Well, I think I think that's a, that's a really good question, I, and I think that could definitely be a potential explanation. That you could say that uh, it becomes maybe very very close when you compare yourself to something where you think it's more like colleagues, and and this is a place where you work. So uh, and and um, so that that could be one reason. Of course, another reason could uh, maybe be that that you are you're sort of. Uh, you're you're asking what you hope, given that you think inequality in that dimension is very important, or income differences. That your your response is what what you what you believe is also more more what you hope really, than what is uh, actually going on. Um, that it's it's really difficult and something that that at the current situation um, from from our survey we could not answer that. Um, that would be sort of a, a second uh, a second step finding out, you know, when we do this across a number of reference groups, why do we see the differences that we do? And as I said, it's particularly among uh, sort of co-workers, uh, it's also to some extent uh, within education groups that people think income differences is most unfair. I, I, I was wondering these errors people make about relative positions about themselves and generally. Is this country specific? Do you have evidence uh, from uh, different countries here? Um, I don't know, Kate, what you would think, what the, what the situation would be in Canada. I mean, people say in North America generally, mm. people have different views about inequality. So uh, is there evidence, cross-country evidence, and is, are there differences? I think that, that is really a first order <laughs> Uh, question here. Uh, so the thing is, what we did here was to link the survey data with the register data. Uh, that implied that we could uh, compare people to their colleagues and therefore get this type of measurement and we couldn't compare it if, through uh, people with the same education within their cohort. We do everything within their cohort. So we do not want to compare a 20 year old person to a, a 50 year old person uh, because of differences in life cycle. I think. Here we are really living a lot from the register data and a lot of the stuff we are doing. Um, so we could only do this type of thing we did here in this paper for Denmark. But some of the questions you could say, for example, on the fairness, uh, would be something that you could roll out on uh, on many countries. And I think that that would be interesting. It, it, but it's the same. I don't know if, if it's the same across countries. Maybe Kate could speculate <laughs> about that on whether you think people uh, would think the the same about income differences. I, I think there's probably some differences across countries. I actually just have a sort of a related question. I'm just wondering, in Denmark, do you have sort of salary disclosure uh, regulations where people can learn what their co-workers are actually making? No. Uh, so it will be, you have it very directly in uh, in Norway, where you can uh, basically, I think, see it on the internet. Uh, you cannot do that here in Denmark, but but, it's, uh, but uh, I think you can at at, uh, at no in, in firms that are that are not on a stock exchange, you can see what the CEO is is earning, for example. I think you can you can probably do it at. Um, get the information at, at your uh, firm, if the firm is uh, sufficiently big, maybe. Um, but it's not like we have sort of any um, like public disclosure as you have it in Norway. Um, So there is one question uh, in the chat which I like about uh, tax evasion and the rich. And the question is, these rich people, why the hell are they evading tax? Because there is a significant <laughs> risk and it's embarrassing if you are detected. It doesn't really change their consumption, does it? So it's also a behavioral question, right? I mean, why would you why would you do that? Yeah, no, so that, that's, I think also that's, I guess, I guess, I have worked with tax evasion myself, and, and normally we do not see higher tax evasion as a percentage of of uh, people's income. Um, so I'm sort of also amazed by these results by by Nils uh, that people were actually that, that you had some people who had hidden uh, so much money away, and um, 
you you get it somehow striking if you know you can say if you have if you're on top 0.0.1% wealthiest person in Denmark, then you know you have have so much wealth. I don't know what to do with it anyhow. So why put it away? And, and you could of course you could ask some of the football players who got into this same problem, right? Some of the top football players. And I think some of the reason may be that you have actually an industry facilitating this. And you, if you are a person who don't, maybe do not really understand what is, uh, what is going on uh, completely, who we'll sort of say, hey, we can save you a lot of money. And you say, okay, if you can save me a lot of money, then I will give you a great bonus. And they will then con- persuade me, oh, this is completely legal and so on. I think maybe that's the reason some of the football players internationally got into these troubles. Um, but I'm, uh, yeah, I, I also think it's, it is uh, surprising when you have so much. Why, why not just pay the tax? Uh, we, we had actually one of the richest person in Denmark once. Now he's dead, Simon Spies, who said, he was asked, what will you do? Because you have earned so much money this year. Uh, we can see that in your company. And you know, you are going to pay uh, millions. And they actually had, uh, they, they thought it would be around this number. They said, what will you do? And he said, oh, I think I will write a check. And I think that was the right response, right? That's how you should behave. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get uh, into the policy conclusions, which are tricky in connection, obviously, as you said, uh, in connection with behavioral issues. Uh, so one question in the chat mentions these nudge units. So for instance, I mean, you know, it's uh, in some countries, uh, have policies where people are kind of persuaded, nudged into saving for retirement and things like that. Uh, so w- would you say that is a significant way to go in terms of policy conclusions? So um, so I think that that the whole idea of notching is it has been super influential and you can see it really working in, in, in some places. What we what we really don't know is, for example, on a large scale here, when you get these people who, who get into uh, to financial trouble, for example, is it the case that, can, that you can do something to systematically change the behavior of, you could say, basically these 5% that where, where you need to identify them before they got into this problem, right? And so, so in my view, that, that somehow requires something like uh, teaching for everybody, say, in, in, in school, in order to, because these persons will often get into financial problem beforehand, Ella, sorry, after, and then you will see, okay, we should have done some notching. Um, um, but in, in general, I think um, the idea that you can, uh, that you should maybe think differently in, in, in many respects, for example, and uh, one of our, uh, my good colleagues here at CB, uh, Sean Led Peters, with co authors, had a, a, a very uh, cool results on, on, uh, on pension. I mean, that was published in the Call Journal of Economics, showing that, that uh, you know, normally we think about changing economic incentives to get people to save more on pension. And what, uh, what they are showing is that, well, it does not seem that people respond so much to, to, uh, to these incentives. But if you change sort of uh, the, uh, the default, as we have seen sort of in other contexts, and how much people are sort of forced to put in these pension accounts, then people could counteract that in different ways, but they don't. And in traditional economics, that would, they would simply counteract it in different ways, right? So I think in these kind of fundamental ideas that, that uh, then you need to think about other instruments where you somehow indirectly, as in this example, you're forcing basically people to, 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 to uh, or put some limits or you uh, put some interest rate ceilings, uh, which is maybe not something where you change, but you end up because you're going to change the packets that people can choose from. Therefore, you choose behavior, right? And then you can see the notching is sort of a, a, if it works, it's a better, maybe a better instrument because you're not changing the choice set of people, but you put a little notch to move them in the right direction. Uh, and I think everything here on this whole idea on what can we do if we observe um, unhealthy behavior and uh, thinking about what we, uh, what we can do. And I think notching is definitely some of the, the, the tools. 
another question coming back to the patient's uh, issue. Uh, so the question is how much of this is the ability property of a person and how much is trained? Are these things maybe trained by parents? Not sure you have a view on yeah. that. Yeah, really uh, super good question and uh, and hard to uh, hard to answer here, right? Um, so uh, so I think it's a little like saying if okay, let's say you have sort of this, uh, where you can see a correlation that goes through uh, that in terms of, of behavior. Then the next question is okay, why do we why do why do we see that and why do we observe that and um one model is of course you know um saying that uh, you you behave like your parents are, are doing or is it something that parents are deliberately doing and i guess uh sort of that's a good old uh, discussion also in in other disciplines of the mozart effect where we can see that parents who play mozart for their kids these kids do better and it's a little like uh, the saying okay if you read for your kids uh, when they're small, then they do better. But then we also have evidence saying that, well, maybe it's just parents who have books on the shelves in their home. They don't necessarily read for the kids, but these kids also do well. Um, and I'm not sure that that is completely sort of uh, settled yet on how much it comes from active decision making uh, of, of deliberately parents doing something versus the children who are sort of, uh, um, you know, in indirectly taking out their behavior or learning from their parents or seeing their parents, obs observing them and then follow a little the same pattern. Um, a re related question about uh, your survey data on uh, opportunities versus outcomes. So here the question is people answering questions, you know, do you think it's fair when inequality is, is due to things to, to behavior or, or other reasons? The question is uh, respondents, if I understand the question correctly, are they actually able to distinguish between uh, outcomes and uh, uh, opportunities? So that is of course uh, a good question. And you can say, um uh, what we do is we ask them simply about uh, the uh, income differences in the same questions across the domains and then of course you could say that um that these differences in, in income and the what why they think that is is uh it's a good question is it really because they think that um um that that you know you they think that everybody should basically have uh, if you have the same education you work in the same sector then you think of people as having the same same earnings capacity and therefore they should also have the same income um and then you say okay but it but on the other hand if people have differences in in education then of course that that is okay uh, because that is because they have differences in earning capacity. And I think at the end of the day, again, it's a little, currently we only can observe a little like reduced form, people's uh, answer on what they say on, on uh, fairness, on income differences, which becomes a little like, we are not saying how much income difference do you have across sectors and within gender, in your municipality, for example. Um, so it, it becomes a little uh, uh, difficult to, to really know what is going on in people's mind. And what we can see, which is another point of this paper, is that when people's social position change, then we have strong indication that people change their view on fairness in general. Uh, so we use shocks that people have experienced, and we, we, we go back to 20 years in people's income history. And you can see a strong correlation between people's current position in the income hierarchy and their views on fairness. And if they got, uh, if, if they got higher up because of promotion, then they think uh, that, it's, that inequality is more fair. And uh, on the other hand, if they've gone down because they got a health shock, disability, unemployment, they think inequality is, is more um, unfair. So, and, and when we compare that to political views, then political views seem much more sticky. It does not change so much. Political view is even correlated with income position of parents, 
which is not the case when we ask about fairness. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so there is this kind of thing that it seems that fairness moves a lot and reflects a lot where people are in their current position uh, from our evidence, uh, certainly if you compare it to political view. We are, uh, this is fascinating, but we're approaching the end of this Q&A session. Uh, I would like to ask one uh, kind of philosophical question at the end. Uh, so you've explained that people seem to accept inequality more when it's due to behavior, and I think that's kind of standard uh, uh, for economists. But uh, there is a, uh, I don't know if it's a literature, but maybe arguments made by points made a lot by the journalists increasingly, but also sociologists, I believe that uh, people are, for a, a lot of people are frustrated in society and maybe even lead to populism, uh, not because they don't, uh, uh, not because they, they, they don't have opportunities, uh, not because society is unjust, but because society is getting more and more meritocratic. And the point, I guess, is a meritocratic society uh, uh, where everybody advances on the basis only of personal merit is a very cruel society because when you end up down in this society, everybody, you know, you, de you deserve it. And, uh, you know, everybody despises you maybe, or a lot of people might despise you. As you just said, people at the top, you know, who think, you know, they've made it, uh, they, they think uh, it's fair that they're up there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there is a way of integrating this and um, I guess I, I don't know what the policy implication of that is, but uh, I, I'd just like to, to to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, so so the, the thing is to say then when people sort of through marriage got maybe up to the top and then they f maybe see at that point they see that it's completely this seems completely natural that that. Um, yeah, that it's fair and we do not need a redistribution policy that 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 matches a little up with what we see that fans you seem to move around with the current position here. Um, but back to sort of the more philosophical, which is, I think, really interesting where because I guess it goes uh, a little against the first uh, evidence. We just, as you say, that everybody agrees that that if it's due to uh, to uh, to behavior merits, then normally we, people are more inequality accepting. And what you maybe see nowadays is something that is actually going, uh, maybe going against that, because now we're getting more inequality in 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 that kind of thing, and then uh, then people may start to think, well, maybe we don't think that as much as we did historically. Um, I think maybe that. So, so one thing is. In the survey I just showed, it would be nice to have seen that over 20 years, whether there's actually a narrowing of the gap where you could say you have something that's due to circumstances and another thing that is maybe due to behavior or, or, or we could say marriage versus, versus uh, random shocks. And of course, one could uh, there could be a hypothesis that over time that that have narrowed because now people are also thinking that now income differences, uh, the, the return to marriage is getting too big. Um, I don't have any uh, evidence on that, and there's also a question on maybe on how one one sort of um, maybe one should, uh, should should design the survey in a more sophisticated way to also maybe catch that uh, dimension more precisely that you're going for. Um, I think that's yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, point. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you, Kate, for this uh, discussion. And uh, I think we're, mo we're moving towards the end now. Uh, and that means over to you, Marcus. Hope you're still there. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, that's it. Um, before before we close the session, uh, just quickly, Clemens, any, any last thoughts on uh, some of the research themes of this evening? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, it was a tremendous discussion. It really has really made me uh, think uh, and uh, has been very inspiring. So um, uh, I would really like to uh, thank Kate and Klaus uh, for uh, a very inspiring laudation and a fascinating lecture. And I think w what's become clear here is that there is a lot of work to do and uh, a lot of uh, research 
uh, before us here, uh, and and I mean that's uh, that's exciting for everybody who does research. So uh, I really think it's great. I also think that. Uh, it, it is known in our discipline that uh, linking behavioral economics to welfare economics is one of the big challenges uh, and linking it to policy implications is one of the big challenges. And uh, I think, uh, you know, that's a truly uh, Musgravian issue. You know, what should the, should the government do uh, in a world where people, yeah, where, where behavioral uh, 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 issues play a role? Um, so it was fascinating to think about that. Um, uh, I would like to thank, so thanks again to Kate and Klaus. I would also like to thank the CES EFO team and everybody who made this virtual Musgrave lecture possible. Thanks again to our sponsors and friends from GLL Real Estate. Uh, and um, last but uh, certainly not least, Marcus, I would like to thank you uh, for the moderation, for doing a fantastic uh, job uh, here. Uh, and for the last time today, over to you. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure, a fascinating evening. Um, also from my side, thank you very much uh, to all of our guests this evening. Thank you to you, Clemens, for having me back again. Um, just leaves me now to close up the evening uh, and inform you that the next Richard Musgrave lecture will also take place online on the 24th of March 2021. So be sure to mark that in your diaries and register for it. So uh, thank you for watching wherever you are in the world. Please stay safe, stay healthy and have a very Merry Christmas. Goodbye.